There we go. Look at this. We had a painting party yesterday here for the elementary kids, and uh, we learned the gospel from the panda. And uh, God provides for the panda, and God provides for us. And uh, we just have a, a couple of slides here of our painters, and you can tell that they are doing a fantastic job. And uh, it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful day. I wish I'd get that guy out of the way so he could actually see. Oh, there you go. And uh, don't they look great? Yeah, we had a great time yesterday. But today we're talking about God's great indwelling, indwelling. And uh, there are four important questions that I would like to answer today that come, I think, from reading the text. And our first question that we're going to ask today is, who are you? And I know as soon as I say that, you're going to tell me your name. Who are you? You're going to tell me your name, but I want to know, who are you? Oh, I love it. Some of you have already filled out the bulletin blank. I, oh, yes. The blanks in the bulletin are there for you to fill out. You are a child of God. You know, I like those retro-looking photos, don't you? Isn't this a cute kid? How many think this is a cute kid? Yeah, that's me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's me, a child. You know, uh, uh, I was born a long time ago, but then when I was eight years old, I was born again. And my second birth, to me, is more important than my first birth. It is. It's more important. And, and the question I have is, who are you? Are you a child of God? That's an important question. He writes in 1 John 4.4, 4, and this is the verse that the song came from. Let me read the whole verse. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one in the world. Isn't that great? You can almost memorize that by the time the sermon's over today. It'd be good for you to have, you know, just chuck this in your pocket and carry it with you, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That's, a, that's, a, that's just such a powerful line. But he's writing, he says, you dear children, and he's not talking about his own biological kids here. He's saying, you dear children are from God. And, and so these are Christian kids. The family of God. Now he says that because not everyone is a child of God. In John chapter 8, Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees. They were religious people. Extreme right-winger religious people. And they were actually so right-wing, they were accusing Jesus of being illegitimate and that he wasn't from the Father. And Jesus says, you belong to your father, the devil. Now, I don't know exactly if that's how the devil looks, but he looks pretty bad there, doesn't he? Truth is, when God created Lucifer, he was the most beautiful of all the beings. So my picture is not very good representation, is it? Not at all. He's called the angel of light. He doesn't come to you in ugly ways, does he? No, if he's going to tempt you, he's not going to turn you off by showing himself up as ugly, but very attractive. But I use this picture because it's the stereotype that makes you know exactly who I'm talking about. Jesus says to these adversaries, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. He is tempting the woman. He says, God did not say what he said. He's, God knows the day you eat of the fruit that he's forbidden, you'll be just like God, knowing good and evil. Whew. He was a liar. That's what he goes on to say. He was a murderer from the beginning holding, uh, and not holding to the truth. There is no truth in him when he lies. See, he's a liar. He will lie to you. He will, he will try to make you think that evil is good and that the good is evil. He'll lie to you and say you're other than the gender that God assigned to you. 
He'll lie to you in so many ways. He will lie, he will lie, he will lie. Because he wants to take you down. He was a murderer, didn't speak the truth from the very beginning. He lied to the woman. She bought his lie. She ate, gave her husband. He ate and plunged the world into sin. That's why our world is a mess today. That's why it's a mess today. When he lies, he speaks his native language. So no matter what he says to you, he's going to some way, even when he states a true fact, he is going to twist the true fact to use it for evil. When the tempter came to Jesus in the wilderness, he used the, the scriptures themselves, but he twisted them so that they tried, he tried to make them mean something they did not mean. Because he is the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. He, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and saying, listen, your mind has already been made up. No matter what I tell you, you are not going to hearken unto it. You're not. Not everyone is a child of God. There are some whose father is the devil. In fact, in Acts chapter 13, the Apostle Paul is really irritated because there's a magician, a sorcerer, who is doing, doing things that counter what Paul is doing, trying to deceive people not to believe in Jesus as their Savior. And Paul is filled with the Spirit of God, the text says. And he turns to this Elymas and he says to him, You are a child of the devil. So not everyone's a child of God, are they? Every now and then I'll hear somebody say, well, aren't we all children of God? You know, what they're trying to say is we're all creatures of God. <laughs> then just say that. We're all creatures of God, but we're not all children of God. He says, you are the child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right way of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you, and he struck him with blindness. Boom. And some of us say, well, that'll learn him, won't it? That doesn't always happen, though, does it? There are those who are the children of the devil who are opposed to the children of God. Wow. This is how we know that we are the children of God. Here, so 1 John 3.10. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right. I like the new uh, English translation on this. It says, anyone who does not practice righteousness. They, they, and we're not perfect. We all sin. We're going to find that in 1 John chapter 1. It says we've all sinned. Chapter 2 says we've all sinned. Even as Christians, we continue to sin, but we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous. But he said, our practice has changed. The person who gets born again has a new nature and begins to practice righteousness. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not a child of God. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. So he starts a new life journey. I met this pastor years ago down in Cincinnati, and he wasn't always a pastor. At one time, he was a motorcycle gang leader. And uh, he, somebody gave him a gospel track, and he read it and convicted by the Spirit of God. He prayed the sinner's prayer that was on it and signed his name to it, went back to his motorcycle club and said, you guys, you got to see this. And he shared it with them, and several others said, well, I want to do that. And they prayed, and they signed their name with them. And he said, pretty soon, man, I had this Bible study going, uh, and the club were all becoming Christians. He said, we do a Bible study, and then we all shoot up and get high. You know why? They were baby Christians. He said, we started studying, we came across the Scripture, it said our body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. We said, well, we can't do this. We can't defile the temple of the living God. And they gave up shooting high and just did Bible study. He finally went on to seminary, became a pastor. Wow. You see, you, your practices change. And if there's no practice, if there's no walk to the talk, you have no reason to believe that you're a child of God. Isn't that amazing? If you're a child of God, you act like your father. He says, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. If you are harboring ill against another believer, 
That is not a sign of being a child of God. It is not a sign. So how do you become a child of God? Nicodemus was one of those Pharisees, you know, that Jesus was chiding later in the book. But in John chapter 3, Jesus, uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night and says, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher. Come from God because nobody can do the miracles you're doing except God is with them. Jesus looks him in the eye and says, you must be born again. <laughs> he, didn't, he, didn't, he used what I call the direct approach. It's like, oh yeah? Boom. <laughs> there you go. John 3, 16. You need to be born again. He said, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. He just tells him, you got, you got to do this, Nicodemus. He says, the wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it's going or where it's coming from, and so is everyone that is born of the spirit of God. He said, listen, no one's gone up into heaven, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven, and you don't believe his witness. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then the most famous verse in the whole Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How do you get born again? You believe in him. He said, you must be born again. So how do I go about that? In John 1, it tells us, he came to that which is his own. Jesus came to the Jewish community, and it says, but his own did not receive him. They crucified him. Yet all who receive him and say, Lord, here it tells us how you receive him. He says, to those who believe in him, you believe that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, that he came into the world to die for your sins, he was buried and he rose again, and you believe in him, he gave the right to those believers to become the children of God. That's how you're born again. You receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. He says, children born not of nat nat natural descent. I'm not a Christian because my parents were Christians. Not by natural descent, nor by human decision. It, it, it's not because I decide, it's because the Holy Spirit works within me. It's not because of a husband's will. A husband can't tell his wife to believe and that she'll be a believer. You can't, you can't impose it on anyone else. But you are born of God. God works in your heart. He convicts you and he infuses life within you. And the first sign of that life is you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You believe in his name and you're born again. In 1 John 5, 1, it says this, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. The word is there is actually is born, okay? That, that is present tense in our English, but actually in the Greek language, it's perfect tense. Perfect tense. And the perfect tense is different than past tense. Perfect tense means that this happened sometime in the past with continuing results so that it continues to the very present. He's saying everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ was previously born of God and it still continues to the present, and that's why you believe God the Holy Spirit worked in your life, and you believe because He worked in your life. You can't produce it on your own, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's the gift of God. Isn't that amazing? That's how you become a child of God. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are you? Number one, you are a child of God. Number two, you are an overcomer. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've been born again, you've got this new life, you're a child of God. He says, dear children, you, dear children, are from God, and you have overcome them. Overcome. You're an overcomer. You've overcome them. And here's this guy, man, he's got hurdles. Isn't that the way life is? You know, there's this special race, we call it the hurdles. All it is is a foot race, right? Except there's obstacles placed in the way. And the whole idea is to jump over them, right? And I don't do so jumping so well anymore. But uh, in fact, I never was a good runner or jumper. I didn't want any hurdle in my way. I didn't want any obstacle in my way. He says, listen, you have overcome the obstacles placed in your way as a child of God. This is great stuff. What are these obstacles? Well, wait, if I look 
previously in this book, I'll sign in 1 John chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, you have overcome the evil one. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Isn't that great? You have overcome the evil one. That obstacle of, of the devil, you have overcome him. I write you because you were strong and, and the word of God lives in you. You've received the word of God. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You by faith have been saved because the Holy Spirit has born, made you born again. And he says, you've overcome the evil one. This is great stuff. I want to suggest to you, that if you're a genuine believer in Jesus Christ, you can never be possessed by a demon, the devil, or Satan himself. And we're going to see as we go on, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That's great stuff. Listen, you've overcome the evil one. Not only that, you've overcome the world. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. The evil one uses the world to get to my flesh, so I battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil himself. But he said, you've overcome them. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. We're the ones who overcome. We don't get sucked in. We overcome them. No. Now, the second question I have here. The first one is, who are you? Number one, you're a child of God. Secondly, you're an overcomer. The second question that I have is, who is in you? He says, the one who is in you. The question is, who is the one? Well, I know from 1 John 4, 13, we know that we live in him, in Christ, and he in us because he has given us his spirit. We have the spirit of God within us. The spirit of God. I was eight years old when I received Jesus as my Savior. That very day when I accepted Jesus as my Savior, I was invaded by the Holy Spirit. I did not feel him. In fact, if I were standing on the scales and it happened, I wouldn't have gained an ounce. He's spirit. I didn't feel it. God says it is so. I believe it is so because God says it is so. The Holy Spirit invaded me, invaded me. In another passage, Apostle Paul writes this, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And so I got uh, Herod's temple here superimposed inside. Whoop, pull that open. Actually, if I did that, it wouldn't be in there. You know that, right? And, and so, but my body is the temple. Now, in Old Testament times, there was a tabernacle, which was a precursor to the temple. Then there was a temple, and it was a building structure. The one was a tent, the other one was a building structure. And God would come down on that structure as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And the Shekinah glory of the Lord would fill the place, called the Shekinah glory cloud. And there's this effulgence of glory that would go in the most innermost chamber and it was this glory of God manifesting his presence that he was in the temple in the midst of his people. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down like a fire on top of the heads of the people, and he indwelt the hearts of the people, and the body of the people became the temple, not the physical structure. Your body, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, is a holy temple and God, the Holy Spirit, is in you. Wow. God lives in me. I know what you're saying. Well, yeah, God's omnipresent. He's everywhere. No, no, no. God was omnipresent in the Old Testament, but he made his, his presence known in a unique, special way just in the temple. God makes his presence known in a very special way just in your body. This is so important, he says here. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Jesus paid the price. 
Therefore, honor God in your body. I'm going to take care of my body because it's his temple. That's where he lives. This is so important. He says it two times. You back up three chapters and this is what he says. Don't you know that you yourselves are the temple of God, spirit that lives in you? If anyone destroys that temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. God's in me. You know, everywhere I go, God goes with me. Everything I do, God does with me. Wow. That's why he said, be very careful how you deal with your body. Don't destroy it. We're told in the Old Testament there's a story about uh, King Belshazzar. Belshazzar. And Daniel was uh, alive at that time, and Belshazzar had taken the vessels of the Lord that his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from Jerusalem, and he was throwing a grand party. And they were desecrating the temples, uh, the, the vessels from the temple in Jerusalem in Babylon. And they were partying, and a man's hand started writing on the wall of the plaster across from him, and it said, Meeny, meeny, tickle of hearts. And he didn't know what it meant. They called Daniel eventually, and he, he describes it. You've been found, and you're short. You've been weighed in the balance. You're done. That night... The Medes and the Persians destroyed Babylon. You see, you can't destroy God's temple, desecrate it, and not expect there to be repercussions. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. Who's in you? The Spirit of the living God. Now he says, he is the greatest of all. I, I, I put this, you dear children are, are from God and you have overcome them the world, the flesh, the devil, because the one who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He's the greatest of all. What makes him so great? First of all, he is the one who regenerated us. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, For as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Spiritually, you were dead. And then something happened. The word was preached, or someone taught it, you heard it on the radio, and you had that aha moment where you believed because the Spirit made you alive. It says, but God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in transgressions and sins. Listen, God infused and made us alive. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. You're born of the Spirit of God. That's what's so great. Without him, I'm just a dead man walking. Secondly, as it says in this text, he's the one that's in you. Thirdly, what's so great? He seals us. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. The day of redemption is when he comes back to get his prized possessions. Jesus is going to come again, and the dead in Christ will rise. We which are alive are going to be caught up together to be with the Lord in the air. He's coming back. But he said, but you've been sealed. Now the seal, whether it was a wax one or whatever form of seal that they used, clay or a tablet, it was a proof of ownership, authenticity, and it was backed by the authority of the one whose signet was on the seal. And what it says here is the Holy Spirit that God gave to us the moment we were saved is the seal. I like to view it this way. In the Old Testament, it says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth. It also says God does not look on the outward appearance. He looks on the heart. And so when God's eyes are running to and fro through the whole earth, looking not on the outside but on the inside, he sees the seal of the Holy Spirit and says, Aha, that one's mine. That's my child. Belongs to me. This is important stuff. The Spirit of God is in us. He seals us. He is the seal. Listen, he baptizes us, for we were all baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ. I don't know how to visualize this so well. In Ephesians, it tells us that Christ is the head and the body is the church. We, the people who know Jesus as our Savior, have been placed into his body. It's the Holy Spirit that puts us in the body of Christ and he is the head and we are vitally linked to him. That makes us a Christian and a part of the church. Water baptism introduces you into local church membership, 
whereas spirit baptism places you into the body of Christ, universal church membership, and it's what the Holy Spirit does. Listen, what else does he do? He fills us. Paul said, was filled with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians, it says, be filled with the Spirit. The idea of being filled with the Spirit is there's no vacancy. You allow the Holy Spirit to have every room of your life, your social life, your family life, your work life, you name it, whatever it is, your entertainment life, your reading life, every part of you. You say, here's the key. Go into that room, occupy it, occupy it, and he will fill you and control you. That's the whole idea here. He fills and controls you so that you do his, his bidding, his will. He comforts us. Jesus called him the comforter that he was going to send, send to us. When you're down and out and there's no one else there that will console and comfort you, God the Holy Spirit is there to comfort you. He leads us, the Bible tells us. He leads us in paths of righteousness. He shows us which way to go. You have that prompting in your head. You know that this is not from yourself. God is speaking to you and you know that because he leads us. He leads us. And he does many more things. He convicts, he anoints, he restrains, he gifts us, he teaches us, he helps us. He even prays for you. Isn't that amazing? The Holy Spirit does all these things. This is what I find so amazing. And he is in me. He is in you. God, the Holy Spirit, dwells in me. The next thing I have here is the question three. Who is in the world? Greater is he that is in you than the one who is in the world. Who is in the world? Well, first of all, you are in the world. <laughs> Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John 17, he's praying that I will remain in the world no longer, he says in this prayer. But they, the disciples, are still in the world. You know that? See, we're in the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. And we have overcome the evil one, right? This is great. Jesus' prayer is already answered. We have overcome the evil one. They are not of the world. See, we, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. I'm in the world every day. So are you. You get up, you go to a grocery store, you're in the world. You go to work, you're in the world. I don't care where you go. You can go to, to the movies, you're in the world. Everywhere you go, you're in the world, you're in the world. But he says, we are in the world among people who are of the world, but we are not of the world. I love wearing my Area 51 sweatshirt and T-shirt for the youth group because Area 51 uh, is the place where the aliens are supposedly at, okay? And, and uh, the Bible verse that goes with that says, not of this world, okay? Why? Because my citizenship is in heaven. I've been born again. I am an alien and stranger here on this planet, planet Earth. I belong to heaven now. I'm a child of the king. I've been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the God's kingdom of light, according to Colossians chapter 1. Listen, I am not of the world. I'm in it like an alien. I'm not of it. So I should not be acting like, smelling like, looking like, thinking like, doing like the world, I should be doing all of that like my heavenly father, like heaven, a citizen of heaven. People should look at me and say, wow, there's something different about you. What? I got God the Holy Spirit in me, folks. They should say, wow, there's something different. Why are you the way you are? Why, why is it with, that you have peace and self-control and love and goodness? Uh, that's the fruit of the Spirit being in me. And I say, why is it you are so patient? You say, that's pretty hard for us, right? I'm picking on ones that are hard. Patient. Why are you so patient? Does anybody ask you that? Why are you so patient? You guys say, it's the fruit of the Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit's in me. He's working. And you begin, listen. When I am filled with the Spirit of God and not acting like the world, people will be provoked to ask the reason of hope that lies within me so that I can tell them about Jesus and how he sent the Spirit 
and he has changed me from the inside out. For if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is gone. Everything becomes new. Isn't that great? Yeah, we are in the world, but not of the world. In the verse before this, he also says there's a spirit of denial in this world. Every spirit that does not acknowledge that Jesus is, is not from God. If they don't acknowledge Jesus, that spirit is not from God. They are deniers. You run into them every day, don't you? They think we're fools for Christ's sake. I guess I am. But they're deniers. They deny Jesus. They deny he's coming back. They deny the Bible. They're deniers. There is a spirit that was pervasive in Paul's day, and it's pervasive in John's day, and it's pervasive in our day. They deny it. They deny it. I don't know. Maybe there's even a denier here. He says, you know, I'm just not buying into this Christianity stuff. They're deniers. They're deniers. He goes on, this spirit of denial is a spirit of antichrist. Do you know the word antichrist only appears in 1 John? You don't find it anywhere else in the Bible. Antichrist. Watch what he says. This is the spirit of antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. The spirit of Antichrist was already present in John's day. Now, I'm not going to explore the whole theme of Antichrist here because i got a message coming up in October. In fact, it's actually on Halloween about perfect timing. <laughs> Halloween, you know, all, all the ghouls and goblins and haunted and all of that and Antichrist. Here he's saying there's a spirit of Antichrist. Now, get what it is. Anti is a... Is a Preposition in Greek, which means instead of. Instead of. Christ means anointed one. Instead of the anointed one. It's a resistance against Christ that he is not the anointed one, but someone else is. And the, the Antichrist claims that he is the anointed one. You see what's going on here? He's also called a false Christ. That was Christ's term himself. Jesus Christ used the term False, false Messiah, false Christ. John calls them Antichrist because they're instead of. Do you realize that this spirit of Antichrist is like everywhere? When a person thinks that I can do good enough to save myself, I ask people all the time, what do you think you got to do to go to heaven? And they'll say, well, good works. Your good will outweigh your bad. If your good outweighs your bad. Now think this through for a moment. If you can do good enough, whatever that is, good enough, if you can do that to save yourself, you've become your own savior. If you become your own savior, you're denying that Christ is a savior because it says in John chapter 4, he is the savior of the world. So when you say, my good works will get me there, you are antichrist in spirit. You are against the true Christ in your spirit. You're Antichrist. That's why he can say, Antichrist is already, the spirit is already here. But notice it says the spirit of the Antichrist. There is one coming end time character called the Antichrist in John's thinking. But the spirit of that is already present. Anyone who wants to substitute something for Jesus to be sufficient before God has the spirit of Antichrist. Wow. So the question four in our text here is, what's your viewpoint? I go to the fifth verse, the verse that followed that fourth verse. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world's viewpoint. What viewpoint? The world's viewpoint. The question is, what is your viewpoint? I find today so many people who claim to be Christians have a world viewpoint and they sprinkle a few little Bible verses onto their life, but they, everything else is from the world's viewpoint. I try to develop a biblical worldview, a Christian worldview, a Jesus worldview, and funnel everything through that. But what is your viewpoint? Do you think and look and hear and listen and talk like the world? 
What is your perspective on life? Is it the world viewpoint? Or he says, but we are from God. I've been born a, a, a child from God. I, I'm a child of God. He says, here, we're not. We are from God. And whoever knows God, they have a different viewpoint. They listen to God. Man, I, my ears are perked. I'm listening to God. When I'm confronted with something in the world, I say, oh, Father, what, what, what should I think? What should I do? How should I act in this relationship? Because I am not of the world. And so my perspective on everything is changed. The real hot potato today is obviously politics. People say, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And I tell them, I'm a Christian. <laughs> I have voted both parties in the past. It's not about the party. Sometimes I probably vote for a libertarian. It's about the biblical worldview that I have. I funnel everything through. What would Jesus have me to do? What does the Spirit of God want me to do? What does he want me to do? We are from God. Whoever knows God, they listen to us, the apostles. He's writing the scripture but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth from the spirit of falsehood. All right, so I'm winding this thing down, and I want to ask this question. What does it matter? Come on, what does it matter? I'm going to tell you right now, it matters a lot. This matters a lot. You need to know who you are. Yeah, I'm that cute little kid. I've grown older, not so cute anymore. <laughs> but I'm not talking about physically, biologically, and all that. I'm talking about spiritually. Who are you? Are you truly a child of God? Is there enough evidence in your life to convict you of truly being a Christian? Wow. I can't answer that for you. I can only answer that for me. Here's the real question. Is who's in you? Is the Holy Spirit there? Does he prompt you? Does he anoint you? Does he teach you? Uh, is he opening your mind? Does he convict you? When you know you're doing something obviously wrong, is he speaking deep down in your soul to your heart? Hey, you know what? You're messing up here. Stop this. Who is in you? Because he who is in you, if it's the Holy Spirit, is greater than he who is in the world. You'll never ever be able to be demon-possessed. Oh, a demon might influence you. A, a, a demon might... I mean, even Satan himself, he goes about, and that's our next one. You need to know who your enemy is. You need to know who is against you because the enemy is out there. It, it tells me in, in uh, James that he, he goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. In Ephesians, I'm supposed to take up all the armor of God to put out the flaming darts and attack by Satan himself and all his minions. Listen, you know who's against you. This is really important. If you know who's against you, but you know who is in you, you will have an attitude of victory that you are the overcomer here and not the defeated victim here. You are on the top. And then you've got to grab hold of what's your viewpoint. Are you really viewing everything through the eyes of the cross and the victory we have in Jesus? You see, it matters a lot, the things that we've been talking about here this morning. You, dear children, are from God and over, have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. I want you to just say that with me. The one who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Say it with me. The one who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Now say it like you really mean it. The one who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the word of God and all these great teachings we've been covering this summer. From our great salvation and great boldness we have in Christ, uh, Lord, to this uh, passage here of the great one who's in us, the Holy Spirit. And even next week as we look at the great reward that you have for us, oh Lord, you want to bless us. You created us to bless us. And you will do that. But today we just thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit has taken up residency within us. He's in us. 
And he does all these wonderful ministries to us and for us and with us. Lord, may we hand over all the keys to the chambers of our lives so that there are no rooms that are vacant, but the Holy Spirit is in us and filling us so that there is, he has possessed every part of us. Take control of us, we pray, O oh God, in Jesus' name, amen.